And hello and welcome to our monthly Beyond the Page book club. This is our 11th edition and delighted to be with you whatever time zone you're in. It's just about noontime here in Boston. I'm Brian O'Donovan. I'm a host here at uh, WGBH in Boston and delighted to be joining you this Sunday morning. I will be joined, of course, by CJ Tudor author of the book in question for today, The Burning Girls. Uh, what a fascinating book it is, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Special recognition to all of the great institutions in Boston who support GBH and are broadcasting, especially in this case, the Boston Public Library, who assisted in securing uh, CJ for us uh, this afternoon. Also a big thank you to Trident Booksellers and Cafe who partnered with Beyond the Page Book Club on this event. Trident is during this pandemic and right now open for curbside pickup and limited capacity in-store browsing. So support your local bookstore definitely and uh, specifically Trident. Visit them in-store 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. seven days a week or on their website 24 seven of course. Now, before we get started, I wanted to explain how all of this will work. During the pandemic, we've been so lucky to have this technology that has allowed us to stay together even when we are physically required to distance. You won't see yourself on video. That's first of all important to recognize and you will not be able to speak during the author interview, but we do want to hear from you. You can ask questions by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. Now you can put in your questions at any point in time. So don't worry about that during my interview with CJ, something might pop into your mind and type it in immediately, spontaneously. I'll do my best to address all of the questions. I probably won't get to all of them, but you do not need to wait for the second half of the event to input your questions, even as I'm talking to CJ at the beginning of it. So feel free, in fact, if that burning, so to speak, question is in your mind, uh, put it in right now. If you see a question that you want to hear the answer to uh, submitted by somebody else, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up button and move it to the top of the list or help move it to the top of the list, depending on how many other viewers will vote for it as well. We will do our best to ask the most popular questions. Now, Zoom has recently rolled out in its uh, in ever never ending improvement uh, schedule. It has rolled out an automatic an automated captioning feature, which is wicked cool. We are excited now to be able to offer this feature so that everyone can enjoy our events. To turn on closed captioning, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription display options will pop up. Now, we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window will open and you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind, of course, that closed captioning might be slightly delayed as the system processes speech. And lastly, we will be asking a couple of poll questions tonight, starting right now. In fact, in the center of your screen, you should see, uh, let me see, in the center of the screen, you should see, is this the question, is this your first Beyond the Page event? You can close this window by either answering the question or hitting the X at the top right hand corner. So we will give you a couple of seconds to answer that before we get started. Again, it should be in the center of your page. You can click and tag the right answer or hit the X at the top of the page. And now the moment we've been waiting for, and I've certainly been looking forward to introducing you to CJ Tudor. C.J. Tudor is the author of The Other People, The Hiding Place, and The Chalk Man, which won the International Thriller Writers, the Strand Magazine Award, and the Barry Award for Best Debut Novel. Over the years, she has worked as a copywriter, a television presenter, a voiceover artist, and the all-important dog walker. She is now thrilled to be able to write full-time and doesn't miss chasing wet dogs through muddy fields all that much. She lives in England with her partner and her daughter, looking forward to a free ranging informal conversation 
this afternoon with CJ Tudor. I understand, CJ, that you'd like to start by reading a passage, and I'm so excited to welcome you here to our GBH Book Club. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Brian. Thank you very much for having me. It's a huge honor. Thank That's you very wonderful. much. Yes, I am. I'm going to read uh, just the prologue from The Burning Girls. Hello, everyone, um, which I have here. You see, I'm all prepared. Because um, I don't want to rattle on too much reading from the book. I thought the prologue would be a nice, succinct introduction to it. Perfect. Okay. So, prologue. What kind of man am I? It was a question he'd asked himself a lot lately. I am a man of God. I am his servant. I do his will. But was that enough? He stared at the small whitewashed house, thatched roof, bright purple clematis crawling up its walls, bathed in the fading glow of the late summer sun. Birds chittered in the trees, bees buzzed lazily amongst the bushes. Here lies evil, here in the most innocuous of settings. He walked slowly up the short path. Fear gripped his belly. It felt like a physical pain, a cramping in his gut. He raised his hand to the door, but it opened before he could knock. Oh, thank God. Thank the Lord you came. The mother sagged at the doorway. Lank brown hair stuck to her scalp. Her eyes were shot through with blood and her skin was grey and lined. This is what it looks like when Satan enters your home. He stepped inside. The house stank sour, unclean. How could it have come to this? He looked up the stairs. The darkness at the top seemed thick with malevolence. He rested his hand on the banister. His legs refused to move. He squeezed his eyes tightly shut, breathing deeply. Father, I am a man of God. Show me, he said. He started to ascend. At the top, there were just three doors. A boy, slack-faced in a stained t-shirt and shorts, peered around one. As the black-clothed figure approached, the boy pulled the door shut. He pushed open the door next to it. The heat and smell hit him like a physical entity. He placed a hand over his mouth and tried not to gag. The bed was stained with blood and bodily fluids. Restraints had been tied to each bedpost, but they hung loose. In the middle of the mattress, a large leather case lay open. Sturdy straps, excuse me, sturdy straps held the contents in place, a heavy crucifix, a Bible, holy water, muslin cloths. Two items were missing. They lay on the floor, a scalpel and a long serrated knife, both slick with blood. More blood pooled like a dark ruby cloak around the body. He swallowed, his mouth as dry as the summer fields. Dear Lord, what has taken place here? I told you, I told you that the devil, enough. He spotted something on the bedside table. He walked over to it, a small black box. He stared at it for a moment and then turned to the mother hovering in the doorway. She wrung her hands and stared at him pleadingly. What shall we do, father? We, because this was upon him too. He looked back at the bloody mutilated body on the floor. What kind of man am I? He turned to the mother. Get cloths and bleach. Now. Whoa. CJ <laughs> Tudor. It <laughs> is chilling. And particularly Ooh. that piece. You know, I'm so glad you read it because um, I finished the book during the week. And, and I had, I must admit, kind of almost forgotten about the prologue of how much the prologue could be an epilogue almost, you know, you have to read it again yes. to, to really realize so much. Of the, I'm so glad you read that and it reminded me of, 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 of the, and, and its power and how it set the, the stage. Well, it's just really great to have you with us. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Where are we reaching you from? Where do you live? Well, I live in East Sussex um, okay. in the UK, which is in a tiny little village called Punnettstown. Um, so very similar, funnily enough, to the tiny little village of Chapel Croft in the book. That doesn't surprise me at all. You're down a kind of south, southeast. Yeah, so it's it's sort of the southeast. Um, it's quite near the coast um, mm -hmm. in the UK. And we only moved here about three years ago because we used to live in a bigger city called Nottingham in the north of the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, but we decided we wanted wanted to change. We also wanted to be closer to family because my husband has family in this area. Okay. And we wanted babysitters. Let's let's be blunt. We wanted babysitters. 
So you're in that kind of rounded area of the south uh, east of, uh, of England. And it's an area, of course, because if you just look at a map, you see that that's where a lot of the Norman invasions would have come, where the Vikings would have come into, yeah. where the Germans basically during the Blitz, during the Battle of Britain would have flown over that area. Hastings is there, for Hastings, example. Hastings are just down the road. I was about to say that, Battle of Hastings. Yeah, just about 20 minutes down the road. So it's a fascinating area to live because of that history and the history of conflict and the darkness of that history. And of course, England is full of history. That's, a, that's a, very much an understatement. Tell us where you grew up, though. You grew up not, not far away, a little further to the west and oh, another, another town steeped in history, Salisbury. Yes, yeah, I, I must. A lot of my family is still there. So I grew up um, in the southwest in Salisbury. And I say a lot of all my family are from that area. And again, yeah, an area with a lot of history. Um, and it, you know, it's again, it's very picturesque, very beautiful part of the mm. country there. And my first book, um, Chalk Map, was set in a small village not unlike Salisbury itself. Even though we moved when I was about seven, we moved to Nottingham, um, okay. in the country. So I kind of um, mixed up quite a bit, mixed up quite a few areas in my different books. So some of my second book was based very much in in the Midlands. Um, and yeah, that Burning Girls was sort of inspired by the move here because it is an area with, with, with a very rich and, and dark and quite macabre history, which just really seemed kind of perfect for a backdrop to the book. Oh my God, is it is it everywhere, ever? But it, for, for an American audience, even those names that you're talking about, Hastings, Salisbury, yeah. Nottingham, I mean, just those names connote so much history to begin with, which features as a huge backdrop, as you say, to the to the Burling, Burning Girls. Talk a little about this 16th century period, Mary, Queen of Scots. It's a period of violence, Protestants against Catholic and how history remembers that depends on how you grew up. I grew up Catholic in Ireland, for example, and our yeah. history is taught very different than, you know, staunch Protestant areas of Britain as to who was the villain, who was the who was the uh, martyr and who was the uh, yeah. the oppressors. Well, it really, yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it really depends doesn't it, on which side you're on. I'm, I'm not religious at all. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, from the point of view of the book and this area, the history that's taught, is certain that, you know, when Queen Mary came into power, um, she basically wanted to convert everyone to the Catholic Church. Back to the Catholic Church, because the, the secession had just pretty much happened, right? And, you know, obviously there were a lot of Protestants that did not want to renounce their faith. They didn't want to do this. Um, so basically, rather than kind of, you know, adopting it, well, you know, we, we, we just, we can all have our own different faiths type of approach that didn't kind of happen really. Um, there was basically, in order to convince people to, to convert, basically if, if they sort of held on to their beliefs, they were imprisoned, they were arrested, imprisoned, um, you know, quite often tortured. Um, and ultimately um, a large number of people were burnt at the stake for heresy, mm -hmm. basically. Um, and there's a, really, there's a long history of it in this particular area because the largest, as they call it, bonfire of humans took place in a town called Lewis, which again is about 25 minutes up the road from here. And you'll find in a lot of villages in this area, they, often quite, they quite often have a monument to the martyrs from that village who were burnt at the stake for refusing to renounce their Protestant faith. And there's one actually in this little village here in the churchyard of the small church up the road. Um, so I, I found this quite fascinating. Um, it's obviously very dark, it's you know very bloodthirsty, um, but it seemed like a very interesting backdrop, a very interesting mm. setting um, for a book that very quickly I decided I wanted to write in a kind of like, it was going to be a mystery, but I wanted to have that kind of folk horror feel of things like The Wicker Man, for example, which is my favourite films. Mm. The whole idea of the burning of the Protestant martyrs and is commemorated in the area because every bonfire night, there are huge processions. There are huge sort of the, the, the bonfire societies. Every village has a bonfire society and they make, you know, they make these huge sort of, um, I, I say idols, they make sort of figures that will be burnt mm -hmm. upon the bonfires. Um, and I thought that it, it, there's something very pagan about it. Absolutely. And again, I thought that would be great to put in this book. And although in the book, the villagers make what are called burning girls, like corn dolls, which they burn, that's fictional, that is made up. But it is based very much um, on these traditions of these bonfire societies, um, and these marches where they march with flaming torches. Um, and yes, yeah, so it's such a rich background, you know, how could I not put it in a book? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And what a perfect backdrop to the type of book that you wrote. We're, we are getting inundated already with questions. So there's a lot out there. 
when you write a page turner, and this could be described as a page turner, do you set it out to write a page turner? Do you say like, I'm gonna make it short chapters, every single chapter is going to end with a, almost a kind of a catastrophe or something that says, oh my God, you know, do you set out to do that or does it write itself in that style? Um, I, I think when you know you're writing a mystery or any kind of thriller or mystery or sort of the crime drama or, or horror or anything in that kind of genre, Yes, you have to be aware that you want to, you want people to keep reading. Um, and yeah, there is that degree of, of trying to create, I think ending each chapter on a revelation or a question, um, I think is, is the most common way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Because you know, you, you do want people to keep reading. And personally, the sort of books that I've always read do that, that kind of you get to the end of the chapter and you go, oh God, no, I must read the next chapter. Um, and definitely that's what I, I want people to take from my books. Obviously, I think, you know, with, with any book of that nature, you have to have a little downtime in it. So although you try and keep it, it fast paced and you want people to keep reading, you have to have a, a few quieter moments within the book as well, I think. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, yes, you know, you do find yourself trying to make sure that you end your chapters on something that will make the reader want to keep reading. Um, and, and, and sometimes there might be a little bit of a tease perhaps as well. Um, and I think naturally, actually, the pace of the book, I tend to find it comes quite naturally now. The chapters tend to get shorter as yeah. you go along sometimes, as Absolutely. you're building up that tension, you're bringing it all together. And again, that creates the pace as well. Absolutely. And there's one chapter towards the end of the book that I think is just a single paragraph. But so, so you, 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 you've built that over the period of time. Now, I want to say to everybody on here, we are assuming, we have to assume that everybody has read the book because there are going to be spoilers as we, uh, as we discuss it. Uh, and uh, please be warned of that. There's no way we can flag everything. But uh, again, even, even if there is a spoiler alert, this is kind of a complex plot. So I bet you won't even realize what we're saying with it. In the, as the book starts, the pro, no pronoun she was used in describing the vicar. Was that deliberate? Jack was her name, obviously, as we learn, but there was a moment of surprise for this uh, uh, reader, uh, Mary, who based Mary Jo, who said, who realized that she was female. Was that deliberate uh, to, to, to kind of throw people off a little bit? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was, it, I just thought it'd be a little bit of fun. When I first mm -hmm. had the idea for the book, um, which was sort of inspired by this small chapel up the road, actually, that was the first inspiration for the book. Um, the idea of writing a, a, a vicar, um, a mm -hmm. priest as the, as the sort of main protagonist, I thought was really interesting. Um, I just thought it was an interesting take. I'd say I'm not, I'm not really religious myself, so I thought it'd be a challenge as a writer as well to, to make this character convincing, but identifiable. Um, I started off with the idea actually of a single father um, and daughter. And then my mind sort of thought, well, actually, you know, what would make it more interesting would perhaps be to have a female priest. You know, we, we've seen male priests who are a bit unconventional before, but what about a female priest who's a little bit unconventional? Um, so, that, so the idea of actually calling her Jack and then not revealing until a few chapters in that actually it's a female priest, I thought would just be a little bit of fun to have as well, particularly because I've often written male protagonists in the past. Mm -hmm. So I thought that would just be a nice little reveal, sort of at the start of the book. It's been really, it's really difficult though, if you haven't read the book, and I've done quite a few panels where people haven't read the book, and I'm trying to talk about it, not saying she, as I've yeah. said, Jack, Jack this, because, you know, I don't want to give it away if people haven't read the book. Yeah, that's that's a little more difficult to do. <laughs> to do. But since, it, since the whole book is one of deception, I mean, you take people in a lot of different directions and then just have a major reveal, or I should say multiple reveals at the end. We're gonna take a break in just a moment, but I wanna get another question in uh, to begin with. Explain the burning girls seen by both Flo and Jack, like the ghostly figures. Are they, you deliberately avoid saying that they were, you know, yeah. uh, ghostly figures. Are they in the imagination? Are they semblances of psychological distress? What do you think there are? Are, 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 are they up to the reader to decide themselves, those burning girls? I, I like to keep things a little bit ambiguous. So mostly I have um, flow seeing figures. Jack doesn't really see them to start with um, until towards the end of the book when she thinks she sees something. Um, so I, I like to have the idea that perhaps they are, perhaps they are ghosts, perhaps they are. They do genuinely haunt the chapel. Mm -hmm. But I like readers to kind of make their own mind up as well. I like to have that creepy supernatural thing in there, but, but not so much so that it actually kind of affects the book, affects the real life mysteries, if that makes sense as well. So it, it's it's a creepier side to the book and I do like to keep it quite ambiguous. Does Is Flo really seeing them? Could it be something she's imagining? I think in my own head, yeah, they are real. 
but you know mm -hmm. exactly if they want to take that that angle or not i think well, again, in the deception of the book or taking it down different paths, I, I certainly had that as well. I was looking at them and saying, is this book moving in a totally supernatural direction or is something else going to be revealed? So that, that was uh, very clever and very, very effective. We are going to take a, a short break from uh, the conversation. We'll be back with CJ Tudor in just a moment. If you're joining us, welcome, of course. We are continuing that conversation. I can guarantee you just from looking at the Q&A tab here that we've got so many questions, so much excitement being generated by this book. We will definitely be trying to get to as many questions as possible. As a reminder, if you want to add your question to that, if you want to ask CJ questions, use the Q&A tab that is located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will do our best, as I said, to get to everyone's questions on the second half of this event. I'd like to introduce uh, Jamie for our fundraising pitch. As you know, Jamie and everybody that's on here, GBH is not for profit, uh, but you have a simple method of how people can continue to support GBH's efforts, not just events like this beyond the page, which I love, by the way, during this pandemic, it is such a, a creative way to keep people connected together. But all the virtual events that we continue to provide, Jamie, uh, welcome to this, uh, this fascinating discussion. How are you? Thank you, Brian. Hello. It's, good it's Sunday morning. Good Sunday morning to you. <laughs> and uh, and to everybody else who's joining us today, thanks so much for um, joining us for this month's Beyond the Page event. And I always say it's great to see a community of people brought together by a fantastic book. So if you enjoyed today's Beyond the Page event, then we hope you'll consider making a donation to GBH. Are you a GBH sustainer? Do you know what a GBH sustainer is? Well, to answer your question, sustainers serve as a steady and reliable ongoing source of support for GBH, allowing us to keep the news and programs you love on air and online. You know, you watch and listen to GBH programs all year long, so why not spread out your support uh, throughout the year as well as a GBH sustainer? Uh, today, if you are able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, you will receive an autographed copy of Sadiqa Johnson's Yellow Wife in time for our next Beyond the Page event on May 24th. If you're in the mood for another great story by today's author, CJ Tudor, then we would also be happy to send you a copy of The Chalk Man, another one of her great stories um, as a thank you gift and set instead. Really, the choice is up to you. The choice is all yours. So in order to get either of these items, all you need to do is please support GBH as a GBH sustainer by giving $5 a month or by making a one-time donation of $60. It's whatever works for you and your budget. And it's really, really easy to make a difference at GBH, all you need to do is click on that link you see in our Zoom chat now. It's gbh.org slash support events, or you can text GBH to 800-492-1111 and just contribute what you can. All it takes is a few minutes of your time, uh, a few dollars on your credit card, and, uh, and you're making such a difference at GBH. So please shower your shelf with more great books in May and support GBH at the same time. It is a win-win situation. And if you're already a member, please know how much we appreciate your support. Happy reading, everyone. And now I will give you back to Brian and CJ. Uh, thanks a million, Jamie. Uh, to CJ there in England, we don't have um, the equivalent of television licenses, for example, for, that support the BBC in a large way. So we yeah. have to go directly to our listeners and our audience, and they have come through in spades to us. But if you That's just great. think of, if just think of what GBH brings to you again, and what Jamie said, we really appreciate that support. So time to continue our discussion with uh, CJ, and uh, we will get to your questions. Remember, use the Q and A function 
question. No need to wait. Jump right in and ask those questions. And there are many of them. Here's an interesting one. Tricia uh, asks us the question that I'm fascinated with as well. How did you come up with Wrigley's character? He really, really won me over, Tricia says. And then, you know, Wrigley always reminds me of a cross between you know, Edward Scissor's hands and a member of the Cure or something, the way you describe him. <laughs> that's probably a good description, actually. And funny enough, I am vaguely related to Robert Smith out of the Cure, but that's that's <laughs> another story. Yeah, um, yeah funny enough, the, the original idea for the character came because um, one of the mothers who is at the school um, was walking past our house with a friend of hers, and we said, hi, hi, and she went, hi, this is my friend Wrigley. I said to her friend, who was a woman, actually, that's a really interesting name. I've got to put that in a book at some point. Yeah. And actually, I'd, I'd want to just use the name Wrigley in a book, because I just thought it was a really good name. Yeah. And then, of course, the double meaning of it sort of made me think of this character who might be called that as some kind of nickname as well. Mm -hmm. um, and from there on, I sort of researched um, this condition, um, the condition that might cause these sort of twitches and things, um, which, you know, is a condition called dystonia. Um, and it seemed this perfect fit with this very awkward character in the book. Sometimes things are as, as random as that, um, a name, and then you, you have a character you want to write, and the two sort of things come together as a perfect fit. Um, and, I, you know, and I wanted him to be very very much this, this outsider character that people did root for, I think, in a way. You, you feel mm -hmm. kind of sorry for him. And obviously, you know, he, he befriends Flo, and it is kind of, you, you feel like it's them against sort of the bullies, really. Um, but obviously there's another dimension to his character. He doesn't turn out to be all that he seems. And, and I like sort of turning that around really as well. So you're never quite sure of him, I think. You know, Absolutely, he's kind of deliberately so. You, that's it, you think, is he, is he all he seems? But oh, you maybe maybe he's just, you know, he is just, just you know, this, this disturbed um, young boy who's, who's, who's unfortunate with this condition he has. Um, but obviously he's, he's quite a lot more than that. <laughs> so yes that was really where where the character of Wrigley stemmed from I think you know creating characters well creating books sometimes is, is like you know you, you pluck these random ideas and it might be something you read or someone you meet or something you see or a name and, and somehow it all feeds into a book and when it comes together and it worked in the case of the character of Wrigley I, I was just really pleased I was really pleased that you know he was, he was a, a good character to write I can only imagine it was a good character right and again it's one of those many twists and turns it takes that there's a sudden twist and you go oh my god yeah, Wrigley is not as we as we thought he was. American Publications an anonymous attendee asks us uh, an American publication changes things by definition at times were there language changes that are required in an American publication of your book or does it come to us as is? Sometimes very minor things I don't think very much was changed in this one at all, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can be as, as, as minor as things like, you know, for example, we might say in the UK rucksack, but backpack perhaps is, is more commonly used in, gotcha. in the US. But I think where things, where things, where we can understand, where we know what we're both talking about, mm -hmm. I think generally you don't really need to change them. It's only perhaps, I think in one of my books that was set in the, in the north of England, there was, um, there's a particular thing that's sort of a northern thing where we talk about a chip cob, which is- what, sorry, chip cob? Chip Cob, yeah, which okay. is basically um, like English fish and chips, um, you know, um, but but in, in a roll or a bath, a kind of sandwich, but it's called a chip cob. <laughs> but as I said, this was, the, you know, it, it's a very sort of parochial thing, very specific to that particular region. So that had to be changed to, I think, a bacon sandwich or something. But so if there's something that's very specific, obviously, you know, you have to make it more universal. Mm -hmm. but, but generally, I think we can, you know, if we use the, the old different word, I think we still know what we're talking about. So not very much, I don't think, was changed in The Burning Girls at all. But it can just be occasionally those very specific things, very specific to location or one particular. Absolutely. Just, just, just some adjustments like truck for lorry, for example, is a yeah. common one. The central character here is Jack. Uh, for some reason... Yeah. For some reason, CJ, I imagine that Jack is an older version of you when I saw your, your picture in the book. And, and that's how I imagined it, you know, this thing. Now we've, we had a chance to meet a few days ago and, and you confirmed it, other than the killer part of it. <laughs> uh, how much of yourself gets written into characters generally? And especially a central character like this, you've got a daughter, you're English, you live in a rural area, you know history, you're moved by history. How much of that gets written into the character? 
put little bits and pieces of yourself into characters. Um, but it's also very interesting to write characters who aren't like you. Mm -hmm. I mean, in my first three books, the main protagonists in all of them were male for a start. So I wrote um, in gender opposite, um, just because that, that felt like they, they were the characters. Mm -hmm. I think when characters come to you, you can't really change it. They are, they are what they are. Um, with Jack, there are bits and pieces of me, um, certainly the mother part. Uh, my little girl is only, she's coming up to eight in June. So she's not a teenager yet. I'm kind of envisaging her as a teenager, I think, in the book. Um, and, and of course, you see, Jack's a priest. But I'm, I personally, I'm not religious. I'm agnostic. Um, but I thought that would be something interesting to write. Um, firstly, in making sure that her belief in her faith is believable. We do believe that she has this religious mm -hmm. belief. But also making her kind of identifiable and down to earth um, and you know, a little bit unconventional as well, you know, so that, you know, other, other people who aren't religious can also identify with her. I didn't want to make her pious. So it was very interesting writing that character and trying to get that balance right as well. I did have a very um, kind gentleman who I know through social media, um, who is a vicar, who was able to offer me some advice on bits and pieces and certainly the practical side of things to do with parishes and churches and so gotcha. on. So how, how, um, how so, yes, yeah, so I think it's sometimes just as interesting to write a character who actually isn't like you in many ways at all. Uh, yes, stretches you sort of more as a writer, but inevitably you 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 do put in little bits and pieces. I think Joanne Murphy asks, "How do you gather and what inspires you for ideas growing up? Why did you choose mystery? There there are two parts of that question: what inspires you and why did you choose mystery specifically." I think growing up, and I was an avid reader as a child, very, very avid reader. And I started off on things like Enid Blyton. Mm -hmm. And then because there weren't really, there wasn't really YA when I was a kid, because, you know, I'm, I'm quite old. <laughs> so, you know, you kind of went from kids' books straight to adult books. So I think I then started, my first sort of taste of adult books was probably Agatha Christie. And I think that, you know, inspired my love of mysteries. Um, I loved mysteries. And then from Agatha Christie, I think I pretty much went to Stephen King. So that inspired my love of horror okay. and creepy, dark, supernatural stories. You even mentioned him a few times, actually, during, during Burning Girls. I do. I'm, I'm a little bit of, I'm a constant reader. So I'm a huge Stephen King fan. My first book, The Chalkman, was very much a homage to Stephen King and, and all those sort of um, kind of books and movies. I, I, you know, I grew up reading and, and watching films like The Goonies and so on. It was, it was a real sort of homage to all of that. Um, so that's sort of where my love of mysteries and my love of sort of horror and creepy supernatural books comes from as well. Um, as for ideas, like I said, they're quite random. The chalk man came from a tub of coloured chalks that someone gave to my little girl for her second birthday. We went and drew stick figures on the driveway. And that's sort of the idea for sort of this childhood game that becomes sinister came from that. Mm -hmm. um, the hiding place was inspired by the school where I went to. I used to I went to school in a, a mining village. Um, and when the mines closed, they left a lot of the tunnels and so on and so forth. They, they just basically sealed them off and left them underground. And I always used to think about these tunnels all under the ground where they lived. And I started thinking about what else could be in there. Um, the other people was, again, it was, it was something that happened following this strange car on a motorway. So I think you take these little random things and then your mind just goes, what if? Most things start with a what if. When we moved here, we passed this little chapel further up the road. And the first, first time we visited and I drove past it, I saw this little chapel perched up on a hill. And it looked very out of place because it didn't look like a typical English chapel. It was white and square with four windows. It looked like the sort of sort of chapel you might see in something like American Gothic. It okay. was that sort of chapel. New, New England, basically. Yeah. New England, yeah, in this little English village. Mm -hmm. And I saw it and I thought, something about that that was kind of weird and creepy. I think I need to put that in a book. And that was really the starting point for the Burning Girls. Oh, so, so, so yeah, it, it's amazing because I, I was thinking of more of the typical English chapel in that situation as you, yeah. as you would the Stone Chapel. Marilyn writes that she loved the book, definitely did not see the end coming, but was wondering about your last name. That's an interesting one because I hadn't, I hadn't even thought about that. But of course, the Tudor is very, very popular here. Uh, there is a wonderful kind of um, love affair between England and uh, the royal family in, in um, in, in, in England, of course, in every single way, including the Tudors. Any relationship whatsoever between that name? Have you researched it yourself? Yeah, sadly, no. No, no, <laughs> no royal connections at all. Uh, we, we, are, we are commoners. 
Um, no, it, it, it and proud of it. I'm proud <laughs> of it, absolutely. Um, I think actually it's it's of Welsh origin um, from some mm. of our research, but def, no, no, there are no sort of hidden no hidden royalty in our okay. background, unfortunately. <laughs> that you know of. <laughs> the prologue it says here, Mar Margot is writing. Now it's a complex ending, CJ. I will admit, and we're getting some questions on this. I actually reread the last five chapters twice, and. <laughs> And, and really, again, to folks joining us who didn't hear CJ initially reading the prologue, that actually is a, a terrific thing to do. You almost should say, read the, if you have any difficulty, read the last chapters again, put the pieces together, and then read the prologue. It really sorts things out. They asked whose mutilated body was on the floor, and, and, and I think I know the answer, but they asked, yeah. was the priest Fletcher? No, it wasn't. It was Grady, right? Yes, yes, it was, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it is very much, it's a little bit like putting the ending at the beginning in a way, because when you get to the ending, yeah. if you go and read the prologue, it pretty much tells you the ending, yes. So, so, so you think, I mean, obviously, again, it's a little bit of misdirection yeah. to the reader to make it think that it could be, you know, the body of the, the girl there. And it, yeah. There. But of course it isn't, it's, it's the priest Grady. Absolutely, um, but only at the end does that come together. Now, if, yeah. for, as a as a mechanical thing, how do you do that? Do you do, do you write do you write the from the beginning? You don't do you write the prologue first? Do you write the first chapter first, or do you look at the ending first? How do you do it mechanically? I I'm what they call I think we quite often say as an author you're either a planner or you're a pantster. So if you plan it all out in great detail, or you fly by the seat of your pants, you start oh, running. Yeah. Panster. You That's a new word to me this Sunday, a panster. A I think, and I, I, think I, I would describe myself as a big time panster. <laughs> I definitely fall into the panster category. I really start off with a, an idea, a, a prologue, a first chapter, a first sentence, and then I see where it leads. Um, what I often find is, though, that I go back and do a lot of rewriting because the story kind of develops as it goes along mm -hmm. and then things change. And actually, the prologue was initially similar, but a little bit different. Um, so what I ended up doing ultimately was going back and rewriting that a little bit so that it was an, an echo. You could have had this echo at the beginning and the end, really. Um, but yeah, my method basically means you get you sort of get the book down and then you go back perhaps and you put in your breadcrumbs as I call the breadcrumbs to sort of showing the reader the way to the reveal um, and dropping things in when you go back in the edits. So I sometimes have an idea of the end, but quite often I'll be three quarters of the way through the book and I haven't quite decided on the ending. I'll have little multiple endings going through my head still. And then decide. So yeah, I am very much flying by the seat of the pants. I write and I see where it goes. But I think actually that makes it more interesting, both for me and for the reader, because quite often some of the, the twists and turns don't occur to me till I'm actually in the middle of the book. And I suddenly think, wow, I could do that because yeah. I haven't thought of that. So hopefully the reader won't have thought of that. Well, and I hope that keeps it fresh and it keeps those twists and turns. Going. It's the best way because the book takes on its own life and its characters yeah. become real and, and make their own decisions in some ways. Yeah, you're not forcing them in a way to yeah. stick to a sort of preordained plot. Yeah. It's, it's developing more organically. And I think you feel that as a reader as well. Exorcism, Kathleen asks us, uh, did you research that whole process of ex exorcism? It's often associated much more with Catholicism than Protestant religions, right? It is, yeah. I did, I did do quite a lot of research on it, actually. It's interesting because it, it is much more prevalent in, in, sort of Catholic, in the Catholic Church. But the, the bit about saying that, you know, even sort of today, many Protestant churches do have a ministry that, that deals with that type of thing is, mm -hmm. is completely true. So although it isn't as widely as a, a sort of something that you associate, I think, with the Protestant church, it is still something that did go on. Probably further back in history, it's not something you would think is, is done so much now. It's something that we have, I think, re resigned to history. Um, as I say, you know, I think I talk about that in the book as well, that obviously, you know, when, when people didn't understand mental illness and those types of things, people looked to the church, people people looked to, it must be demons causing mm -hmm. this. And obviously, you know, as, as we, we now know a lot more about people and, and minds and mental health and everything, yeah. um, it's, you know, and it's not something we turn to. But it was interesting reading about it as well. Um, and, you know, I, I like researching stuff like that. So it was it was an interesting thing to research. Obviously, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of fictional license 
<laughs> in the book. Well, it, uh, it, it blends in perfectly, obviously, because it creates the implements and the recordings and everything else as a construct. Wrigley, it says here, uh, Christy writes, and this is an interesting one, because you make a lot of popular references through the book. You know, you make a reference to, to popular music, to other movies, to Stephen King, as we said. And Christy writes that Wrigley is nearly an exact analog of of Kaiser Soze, I think. What, what you mean, isn't that what the name of the of the uh, of the character in the movie The Usual Suspect was? Yes. Uh, and and of course he mentions it himself in the book. So was the Usual Suspects? Uh, Christy wants to know was it was it an influence in the in your writing? Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly was. It, I, I thought his character, in a way, obviously just had echoes of the the Kaiser Soze character and. When I started writing him, yeah, I thought it would be fun to drop that in. I thought it'd be fun for him to reference it, so he can obviously re-reference it when we find out that you know all along he has been he's been faking this and he's not who he pretends to be. Um, so yeah, I like those little things because I think I, I, I like books and I like writing and I like series that are, are knowing in their references. Because mm -hmm. rather than someone say, "Oh, it's a bit like that character out of The Usual Suspects," have your character make that reference themselves because. I like that little knowing wink sometimes. And it, it, you know, it, it's fun to play with that language. So, you know, he mentions Absolutely. it at one point and then mentions it again when he's, when he's putting Jack in the boot, basically. The so greatest I, trick, I, the I greatest like trick of the devil, he says. The greatest trick of the exactly. devil is pretending it doesn't exist. And plus it's a great line because I always thought that that line tied up really well with the whole themes of the book as well. Yeah. Somebody, another uh, uh, listener who's joining us this afternoon, it obviously liked Wrigley. As you said, a lot of people are led to like Wrigley and kind of see him as the underdog. So uh, they don't understand why Wrigley became such a psychopath and choosing <laughs> Flo seemingly out of the blue to torture psychologically and also him faking the dystonia. What are you <laughs> thinking? He was my favorite character. That I'm adding that last comment. But, but they were obviously annoyed a little bit that Wrigley didn't turn out to be <laughs> what he was. And was that a deliberate one again? You knew that Wrigley, when you when you envisioned Wrigley, that he was going to turn out to be a, a MacGuffin and the whole thing, right? I did. I it's one of the few things that I kind of knew was going to happen. I say I, I don't plan that far ahead, but I always knew that Wrigley was going to going to turn out to be a wrong one, unfortunately. Okay. Um, and it was sort of, you know, faking this whole thing all along. And I think you know, I, I sometimes think, although it's it's obviously it's good to have reasons for why characters do bad things as well. I think sometimes, as we say in, in the book, you know, with, with the Wrigley character, I quite like the idea of, of saying, you know, sometimes, you know, there is no real explanation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, because, you know, it does obviously look into that. The reason, I, I like looking at the reasons why people, you know, commit crimes, why people do awful things. I think that's one of the, the interesting things that you can sort of look into when you're writing crime novels. But sometimes I think it's also interesting to have a character who you can't quantify why they do these things. Even he himself is, you know, mocking when you, he's sort of giving the explanations to Jack about why he's doing it, you know? Yeah. So uh, that's why I thought, think makes him a very interesting character. Some of those sort of characters that you go, you, I'd almost like to write again, if that makes sense, you know, to, to sort of rejoin him if I could, but I can't, obviously. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, well, maybe, sorry, you get the ongoing adventures of Wrigley. Uh, yeah, and that, that could happen as a, <laughs> as a sequel, but he's gone, isn't he? I mean, it might, it might gone, be a, pre, a prequel. <laughs> One of the things I love about your writing, CJ, and I, I, I'm always looking at writing like this, is that apart from the plot and the overall story, I love the detail of paragraphs, the, the way you describe just ordinary life, opening a door, uh, the, you know, the, the quality or the actual specifics of a sandwich, the type of coffee, you know, the smells of a room, for example, even the undramatic smells of a room, uh, animals, etc. in it. I, know, I, I remember like commenting on this to myself once and when I was reading that passage where that uh, a tense passage where the cleaner comes to the door of those old age couple who have been uh, unceremoniously sliced by Jacob. And, and she's basically dealing with the dog. And she says at the end of it, before she closes the door, she says, nose in, she says to the dog. And I said, this is detail that I love because it immediately transports you to a place and a situation. Is that a deliberate way of writing to get people to buy into the overall atmospheric of a scene or a, or a novel overall? It's funny, isn't it? Because you know, I, I don't know if you think of it when you're writing it. Um, I think you're just you're sort of in that scene and you're trying to make it sound, you're writing it as I suppose you, you imagine people would speak. So you, mm -hmm. you're, dialogue's very important to me. So things like that is, is what 
what I would say perhaps before the dog, you know, when, when we, we, we shut the door on the dog, you go, nose in, nose in, or when you're shutting the boot. Yes, and absolutely. And, and I suppose you're just writing those people as they would speak. So dialogue, I think, is very important. Um, you know, I, I used to work in radio, so I used to work a lot with dialogue. Um, and it's one of the things, some of my biggest bugbears, if a book gets dialogue wrong, if it feels contrived, I hate that so much. Turns it off, yeah. Certainly absolutely. getting dialogue right is very important. But I think within books, even though you might not be sure be aware you're consciously doing it, yes, getting those little details, the, the minutiae, the everyday, ordinary stuff, right and real. It makes everything it, believable makes everything particularly when you're writing stuff that obviously isn't believable particularly with supernatural if you're putting yeah. in any supernatural element at all you know you need to make sure that your reality is really grounded and believable because then you will take the reader with you if the Absolutely. small stuff's believable then they're going to go with you to the more bigger unbelievable stuff and that's you're, that's vital i think you're certainly the, the you're certainly describing me i'm going to uh, in in how i read i'm going to kind of speed through this because we're we're running out of time we've got a tremendous number of um of uh, questions that I want to get to. I want to reread it, Lauren writes. I know the ending, you gave readers many, many hints. And, and she talks about the familiar scent and she talks, Jack looks over the pews and first week yet some races she recognizes and other she barely remembers as she looks over the pews. She talks again, uh, Lauren does about the details in your writing. Janine Myers writes that as she read Burning Girl, she was reminded of the Judas Child by Carol O'Connell. Now, I don't know that book or a writer, but she's asking generally, are there authors that have influenced your writing uh, and, uh, and choice of, of, of genre? What would those authors be or who would those authors be? Yeah, I mean, I say obviously Agatha Christie was my first introduction to the mystery mm -hmm. genre. Um, but I mean, I'm, I am a huge Stephen King fan. I love Stephen King. Um, he's been a huge influence. When I was a teenager, I read a lot of horror: Stephen King, James Herbert, Dean Koontz. I adore Harlan Coburn. Um, again, you know, for, if you love twists and turns, he's just a master of those type of twists and turns. Um, an author called Michael Marshall Smith. I'm also a big fan of um, because again, he's a great author for mixing genres. Um, he started off writing more sort of sci-fi material and then moved more into thrillers, but he mixes genres very well. He also is one of those authors that writes just wonderfully about sort of life and loss in the middle of mm -hmm. these quite often macabre thrillers or sort of sci-fi novels. He'll write a beautiful sentence about love or loss um, and, and has a very dark sense of humour. I love dark humour in books as well. Um, so, so yeah, those were a lot of authors that sort of certainly influenced me, but I'm continually finding new authors as well. You know, this is, this is the thing, you think you're quite well read and then someone will say, have you read such and such book by so-and-so? And you're like, no, I haven't. <laughs> you know, there's, there's so many books and I'm, I'm constantly feeling that I, I need to read more. Yeah, absolutely. I think the older we get, the more we realize that that our list is getting longer <laughs> and our time is getting shorter. It's one of the great frustrations of my life. Love the characters, Tracy writes, and wonders what happened to so many of them next. And I, I think this is a great question, actually, because the one character that I find myself thinking about is Jack's brother, Jacob, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you think about these characters after the book and think about what happened to them after the book ends? And that's the one character that I think what actually happened after he did what he did out of the church. I kind of it, it's left to my imagination. Is that deliberate? Yeah, I think so. I think it's it's. It's good to let them go and have a life after the book, if that makes sense. I certainly think you don't want to make all the endings sealed off for all of your characters. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes, you know, I've, I've always, I've, all my books have been standalones. I haven't, you know, had a recurring character as yet. Um, although on, on book five, I am going to have a character from the previous books come back. Because sometimes some characters, yes, they do stay with you. And you do feel they have more of a story to tell. There's just something about them that makes you want to, find out what happened to them. So some characters, yes. A lot of the time when I finish a book, that, that story and those characters are done and I'm always eager to move on to the next set of characters, which is the joy of writing standalones, of course. Each book is a fresh new playground, fresh new situations, fresh new characters. Um, but, but sometimes there are some that stick with you. There's, there's a few from the books I've written that, you know, I, I could, could revisit. And I say one character in particular, it seemed the right time and the right book to have that character come and play another role in a different book. Fascinating. Movies and series, for example, you read this book and you kind of go, oh, 
it's going to lend itself. More of us during the pandemic, of course, CJ, have been watching far more television than we ever would have at any other time in our lives. So we kind of think in terms of movies and series. And this one, I think it's hard to read it if you haven't been binge watching stuff. It's hard to read this book and some of your other books as well without thinking of them on the screen. Uh, so give us kind of an overview of that. Is that something a Brian writer thinks about? What are the specifics about the books you've written and particularly about, uh, about the Burning Girls? Is there, is there a movie, a series on, on tap for them? Well, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you write you write books because you want to write books rather than sort of scripts. But um, all four of my books have been optioned um, for screen. Mm. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they will make it to screen or it may be several years because it's quite a slow process. Um, both the Chalkman and the Burning Girls are at script stage. Hans Rosenfeld, who wrote The Bridge, and Marcella is actually um, going to be doing the script writing on The Burning wow. Girls. That's a big deal, isn't it? Hugely exciting. Yeah, I'm a massive fan. It's a huge honour. Um, so I'm thrilled by that because I, you know, I, I just imagining what he could do with it is is, is brilliant. Um, so it's exciting, and of course, it's you know, it's a thrilling thing to think that perhaps something you've written might be on screen. I'm quite a visual writer, um, but these things take time, and it's it's certainly not when I you know when I started writing, I just wanted to be able to write books, you know, and it took me a long time to get published, well over ten years to get published. So the thrill for me is in seeing my book there on a bookshelf. And anything else would just be, you know, wonderful icing on the cake. It's not something I sort of think about when I'm writing. Um, I mean, obviously, so many books are now adapted for a limited series for television. Um, so it would be amazing. It would be amazing to see something like that happen. But I'm, you know, thrilled to get a chance to write books because that was always the dream. Absolutely. And I'm sure it can be a distraction as well if you if you allow yourself to move too much in that direction. As you said, you're writing more of a script than, than a book, which is a danger in itself. Mary uh, asks, uh, definitely need to reread the book. And I think this is an interesting question because she says, thank you for explaining your methodology and the seat of the, the pants, uh, pantsing. Is that the term you use? Because I'm going to use it again uh, myself. Yeah. <laughs> pantsing. Explain the, explaining the twists and turns. Do your readers often say that they need to reread it or reread your books? And is that a compliment or a criticism? I take it as a huge compliment, you know, whatever the reason, whether it's to sort of spot the, the clues this time around or just because they enjoyed the writing. It's, it's mm -hmm. one of the compliments I could even give to a writer is that, you know, they want to reread a book. And some books do deserve rereading for, you know, for that very reason. You know, what I always say is that if you're writing a really good mystery or thriller, the reader should feasibly be able to, to guess the ending, to guess some of the twists and turns, because that's part of the fun of reading is guessing some of the twists and turns. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be something that comes completely out of the blue. If it's a surprise, that's great. But the reader should be able to go back and find those clues planted in the book, find those breadcrumbs that you've dropped along the way, because otherwise you're cheating the reader. You know, yes. if it's just a, a, such an ending that you couldn't possibly have guessed it at all from anything that's gone on in the book. That's not fair. You, you know, as a reader, you should be able to kind of play detective to yeah. guess it as you go along and see whether you're wrong or right. Um, and I think it's fine to guess some of the twists and turns and hopefully perhaps not guess others. Absolutely. So that's, you know, rereading it. Hopefully if you reread it, you'll go, ah, you see, I see what she did there then. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I just, I did, uh, I did uh, multiple times. I said the last few chapters, I wondered if I dozed off and missed the connection. And, <laughs> and I hadn't actually, but I put it all together. And again, I, I recommend out there is that go back and read that prologue that CJ gave us at the beginning, because I think it really, really uh, ties a lot together. The very beginning of the book, quite frankly, I had, I must admit, I had forgotten it a little bit. And I, when you started reading, I went, oh, there it is. <laughs> CJ, in terms of uh, your own reading, what are you reading currently? What, what, what do you like to read? Uh, do you like to read fiction, nonfiction, both at the same time? And, and what are you reading currently, for example? I, I try, sometimes I try and read out of genre when I'm writing. Um, you know, I read a lot of books that are very Sorry, you, you, you said it again, you like to read what? Out of genre? Out of genre, genre. yes. Okay. Sometimes when I'm writing, because I think it's very easy otherwise to sort of almost absorb another writer's voice if it's a okay. similar genre to yours sometimes. I, I think it's good sometimes to read something different. Um, at the moment, I am reading, well, I started reading a book called Circus of Wonders by Elizabeth McNeil, who mm. wrote a book called The Doll Factory. Oh, yeah, um, I love that. That was a, a well-known book, a bestseller. Yeah, I think, yeah, so it was, 
historical fiction, which I never used to read actually, um, but particularly the premise of this one um, about uh, it's set in the, um, I think it's the eight, 1865, I think it's 1866 in a small coastal village about this girl who has these birthmarks that, that sort of dot her skin and she ends up being kidnapped by a circus and is christened the leopard girl. Um, and it's sort of all about um, sort of, you know, sort of her life story really, but it, it seemed quite an interesting premise. I started reading that. And then I kind of put that aside because it's quite an involved book and I'm trying to concentrate on edits at the moment. So I picked up uh, Stephen King actually, short stories, Bizarre of Bad, um, Bad Dreams, which I realized had been sat on my shelf and I hadn't read. And actually short stories are perfect to read when you're writing and editing because you only have to give them a small amount of attention span. Mm -hmm. You don't have to sort of involve yourself with a big sort of book. So I'm reading that at the moment as well. But I love, you know, I've, I've, I'm a huge fan of sort of thrillers and, and sort of, horror and all those sort of dark novels so you know there's there's a lot of writers that there's a lot of great books i've read recently i love an author called samantha downing um who wrote a book called my lovely wife it's a very dark thriller about a husband and wife pair of serial killers which is brilliant wow and the second book he started it is also great about this group of well basically psychotic siblings who have to go on this road trip in order to get an inheritance <laughs> and all sort of things out and mysteries along the way well, um, certainly, certainly there's a lot out there. And actually, yeah, we, like we have, um, in fact, assembled uh, Jen Gilchrist, who, who helps us organize these, uh, reminds me that we have assembled your recommended reading list uh, oh, from, yes, from she. Yeah. yeah, so you all you have to do is go to wgbh.org slash events and look at this beyond the page reading selections and uh, you will find it there wgbh.org slash events by the way has all of the events that we have listed um and and there are some amazing ones cj that that our team has put together here it's really wonderful Brilliant. um but it's it's absolutely uh, terrific to be talking with you what's your encouragement to young writers out there what should they do you know you talked about it took you 10 years yeah to get your first publication that that talks about tenacity and a lot of um, a lot of an ability to to absorb uh, absorb disappointment basically right yeah a bit of a masochist really um, i think you do i think you just you, you have to love writing and that that's almost a given but mm -hmm. you have to love it to the extent that you know you you plow on in the face of that rejection um, you write for the sake of it. In, in, a way you, in a way, you have to write almost without a goal of publication. You have to just do it because you enjoy it and you can't not do it, really. I always say, even if I'd never been published, I wouldn't have stopped writing because I couldn't have. You know, it, it's a compulsion more than anything. But I think, yeah, you do have to stick at it. If you, you know, if you want to see, you know, your book published, you have to accept that, you know, you may get rejected. You may spend a long time writing one book. It may get rejected hundreds of times. And sometimes the hardest thing I think to accept is, as well as being tenacious about it, is, is knowing when to actually put that book aside. Not saying I'm not, I'm not a good writer, I have to give up, but saying this is not the one to write something else because that may be the one. This is not the time for that book. Maybe it will be, you know, maybe I'll come back to it. But sometimes knowing when to leave that book and start something afresh is also something I think you have to know. You have to know when to give, give it up and write something else. But, but yeah, you, you do have to stick at it and you do have to just keep plowing on because everybody gets rejections. There are very few people who write one book, it immediately gets published and is hugely successful. So, you know, most debut writers have a, a back catalogue of failed projects. <laughs> so if you get rejections, just go, you know, it's happened to all of us. Do it again. Come back and fail better, as they say, and get the rejection, yeah. but get a, get a more encouraging letter and you've got the... Uh, it's those little things that encourage you, I think, as well. You know, absolutely. And it be better. Absolutely, and then you'll be like C.J. Tudor with the Chalk Man, her her uh, book, uh, award-winning book on the wall behind her. There, I can see it uh, hanging on the wall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there it is. <laughs> And the Burning Girls, I'm sure, somewhere as well, or will be sometime soon. We've really, really enjoyed this being part of our uh, Beyond the Page book group, CJ. Thank you. It's really yes, wonderful. I, I do tend to ramble, so, uh, you know, I hope somewhere in my ramblings. <laughs> hey, from a fellow pantser, uh, it's great to be chatting about that and knowing that there are other folks like us out there. It really is great to talk with you. Our next uh, reading, our next book is Yellow Wife by Siddiqui Johnson, which I haven't read. It's added to the list, which is now about the length of the catalog for the library at Alexandria. 
um, at this stage, but it's really a terrific event that these folks have put together. And uh, that virtual conversation will take play on, place on Monday, May 24th at 7 p.m. I encourage you again to support GBH wherever you find the opportunity to do so and to go to wgbh.org slash events for the full list of everything, including beyond the page, but many other opportunities to join some interesting conversations. Again, CJ, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and uh, look forward to reading your next uh, next book, by the way, is coming up. What is it? What is it going to be? Give us a little next bit. It's of... called at the moment, the sixth, and it's coming out around sort of early next, early next year. So yeah, please do grab a copy, folks. And this... thank you so much for having me and everyone for coming along. Thank you. Ab absolutely, CJ, the sixth. To look it out, look up uh, CJ Tudor. She's got a lot of information as well on her website. Talk to you soon. Bye.